Hello, uh, in this class uh, we are going to look at uh, the ferroelectric phenomenon and uh, in the context of the uh, nano scale. Uh, and as we have seen in all these classes, uh, different uh, material properties uh, actually give you very interesting uh, options when you go to the nano scale and uh, therefore, you end up manipulating the material in different ways uh, to help you accomplish something si by simply going to the nano scale. So, we will uh, look at uh, in this class the learning objectives for us are uh, we will look at the use of nano sized ferroelectrics. So, uh, what is that sort of you know domain of application technology wise uh, and so on where uh, there is uh, some uh, utility to having nano sized ferroelectrics. Uh, we will also then uh, look at what are the challenges uh, in producing such uh, nano sized ferroelectrics. Uh, as you will see uh, through the class it is not uh, that easy uh, I mean there are uh, many ways you can get nano sized particles. But if you go to the nano sized particles typically there is some difficulty in uh, then uh, uh, accessing the ferroelectric effect at the nano scale uh, and therefore, there are some challenges uh, in that context. Uh, something about systems in which these challenges have uh, been overcome and uh, in that context what is that uh, you know how have they overcome it. I mean, so, there is some system where they discovered that you know you can actually do it better uh, very recently they have discovered this thing and uh, we would like to see. Uh, how they have overcome it, uh, what is the thought process behind which uh, using which they have overcome it and uh, that they have been able to demonstrate. And therefore, finally, the effect of uh, nano size on the ferroelectrics uh, which is part of uh, the uh, important information which was used to uh, uh, you know determine this uh, uh, you know uh, overcoming this uh, uh, limitations of ferroelectrics in the nano scale. So, to overcome that uh, they had to look at the effect of the nano scale on the ferroelectrics and therefore, uh, figure out a way to overcome it. So, these then are our uh, learning objectives we will as we go through the class uh, we will look at these objectives. Uh, as always we will talk of uh, the general concept involved, the uh, thought process involved, the phenomena involved uh, and uh, towards the end of the class I will give you a couple of references. Uh, there are many such references I will uh, direct you to a couple of references which uh, uh, look at these uh, details uh, in uh, you know in uh, more specifics and therefore, you can uh, go and look that up if uh, you have more interest. Okay, so, what is a ferroelectric material? So, let us start with that and then uh, from there we will figure out what the nano size does to it. So, the point is generally if you take any material, okay, so uh, you take a block of iron, you take a piece of uh, aluminum uh, and so on and you keep it, uh, it could even be a polymer material, it could be your ceramic cup that you have uh, any of these materials. If you simply put uh, uh, you know uh, take a voltmeter uh, or multimeter uh, multimeter and you put uh, set some voltage uh, I mean set it to read voltages measure voltages and you put the two electrodes on either side of the material you are basically going to see 0. Okay. So, you will see 0 voltage uh, that means the material does not have an inherent uh, potential developed inside it. So, that is the um, uh, significance of the fact that it is showing you 0 volts. So, um, however, uh, the there are some materials where it turns out that there is spontaneous polarization. That is uh, even though there is an absence of an electric field, it is still showing you uh, that it has got some charge developed. Okay. So, normally in other materials in metals it is difficult if you put a field uh, if you try to put a uh, potential difference it will start passing current uh, and you will simply see the IR drop. Uh, but if you take any uh, insulating material, let us say you take uh, uh, whatever some zirconium oxide something something like that and put two electrodes on either side of it. Uh, so, it then behaves like a dielectric material you put uh, this material here and then on either side you put two electrodes and let us say you connect this to the negative of uh, battery and then you connect that to the positive of that battery and you do something like that. So, you build positive charges here on the electrode. So, this is the electrode and you build negative charges here. So, this material in the middle which is the uh, dielectric material will uh, build the opposite uh, kind of charges to compensate for uh, these uh, this build up. So, you will see positive charges built here and negative charges built here and this will be in proportion. So, what is coming from that material will be in proportion to what you are applying uh, using those electrodes and that is how the overall charge neutrality gets maintained. So, this is what you see in most materials. So, now when this uh, uh, what you are applying drops to 0, when this drops to 0 
if it is 0 volts then you do not see any polarization. Okay, so, for most materials this is the case you if you uh, if you put 0 volts you will see no polarization. Now, what we are saying is uh, uh, this polarization is this idea that you have these charges separated you have positive charges sitting one side negative charges sitting the other side. So, what I have shown you here is polarization that the material that is in the middle got polarized it got plus and minus charges separated out. So, this happened in this particular case uh, because you applied a voltage externally applied voltage you put on electrodes touching that material and then the polarization of that material happened. When that externally applied voltage dropped to 0 the polarization also dropped to 0. So, there were no further uh, uh, no separation of uh, uh, positive and negative charges that separation of positive and negative charges is polarization voltage drops to 0 the separation also drops to 0 and then you have. So, uh, a net neutral material. So, generally that material is a net neutral material any time you pick it up it is neutral that is the way it is, but some materials some materials are having this situation where even if you are not applying an electric field. Okay, so, even if it is 0 volts, even if the applied electric field is 0 volts, okay, so you have not applied any external electric field, even if you apply no electric field it will show you polarization. So, it will show you this uh, polarized behavior I am just uh, I mean for uh, schematically I am just showing it to you. So, in the absence of any applied electric field it will it will sit in this manner it will sit polarized. even in absence of applied field. Okay. So, this is uh, uh, so this type of a material is called a ferroelectric material. It is very analogous to a ferromagnetic material where also you have magnetism in the absence of any other applied magnetic field. Okay. So, ferromagnetic uh, so uh, similar to or analogous to ferromagnetic material. Okay, so, similar to or analogous to ferromagnetic materials. So, there also you see magnetism in the absence of an applied magnetic field uh, whereas, in paramagnetic materials diamagnetic materials you see their magnetic response only when you are applying a field applying a magnetic field on them. So, in response to the applied magnetic field the material response in some way you drop the field to 0 the materials response also drops to 0. But in ferromagnetic materials you apply the magnetic field it responds to the magnetic field, but the moment you drop the magnetic field it continues to stay magnetized. So, that is the idea similarly for ferroelectric uh, materials you uh, 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 for some of them you might have to apply an initial field to get them to get polarized once you have done that you drop the field it will remain polarized. So, that is the uh, idea here so that is a ferroelectric material. So, why does a material show ferroelectricity? So, what is that uh, phenomenon that is happening inside that material that uh, helps that material demonstrate ferroelectricity to us. So, for that let us look at a typical material uh, that is often used to uh, highlight this phenomenon which is barium titanate. Okay, so, barium titanate is what we are looking at. Okay, barium titanate. So, it has this formula B A T I O 3. So, you can think of it uh, so structure wise what I am showing you on the uh, image here is the structure that you can think of uh, associated with this uh, barium titanate. So, for example, uh, it you can think of it as an FCC structure uh, in which you are putting specific atoms at specific locations and that is how that crystal uh, uh, I mean uh, happens to be. So, for example, uh, if you take barium here which is a 2 plus oxidation state this 2 plus oxidation state it sits at all the corners. So, there are 8 corners and each of these corners is shared by 8 other uh, uh, you know uh, I mean 7 other uh, uh, unit cells. So, totally 8 unit cells share each corner. So, if the cubes if you arrange the cubes that is how it will come. So, therefore, 1 per cell okay, per cell per cell you have only 1 uh, atom and that is why you get B A uh, T i has an oxidation state of 4 plus that sits in the middle 
So, that is one uh, T i sitting in the middle. So, that T i completely belongs to this uh, unit cell. So, one center, one per cell. So, uh, uh, again you get uh, uh, one and one and then finally, the oxygen which is uh, in the oxidation state of 2 minus, 2 minus oxidation state, they occupy all the phase centered uh, locations. So, you have here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 phase centers, each is shared by 2 cells and therefore, uh, 2 adjacent cells and therefore, you have 2 per cell on average. 6 by uh, divided by 2, uh, I am sorry 3 per cell, 6 divided by 2 is 3 per cell. So, this is uh, uh, what you get and that is how you get, <coughs> excuse me, that is how you get uh, barium titanate. So, you get uh, barium from this, then you get uh, titanium from this and oxygen from this. So, that is how you get your uh, BATIO3. Okay. So, now <coughs> excuse me, uh, now you have uh, positive charges in this uh, uh, cell unit cell and you have negative charges. Now, there are wide range of uh, materials most of the uh, uh, you know ionic crystals are all like this. You have uh, cations and anions and they are all present in the crystal. Uh, however, uh, they are all neutral. <coughs> yeah, how, how, however, they are all neutral. So, uh, overall neutrality is maintained in most of the materials despite the fact that you have positive charges and negative charges uh, and there is a wide range of such materials. I mean there is a huge number of uh, ionic solids where there are positive uh, positively charged ions, negatively charged ions, but the whole material is neutral. Why is the whole material neutral? The reason the, it is uh, the overall material is neutral is that the center, the geometric center of all the positive charges put together is the same as the geometric center of all the negative charges put together. So, you take a weighted average of all the positive charges and see what is the center corresponding to all the positive charges that exist in that system and then take the weighted average of all the negative charges and see what is the center of that uh, negative charge. You will find that the two of them the positive charge and the negative charge have the same center and the value of the positive charge and the value of the negative charge is also equal. So, if the two centers match and the value of the two charges matches then you have a net neutral material right. So, um, center of positive charge uh, should coincide with center of negative charge. So, this is for a net neutral material, for net neutral material. Which is what like I said most materials are net neutral, net uh, neutral. So, center of positive charge should coincide with the center of negative charge and magnitude of positive charge should coincide with magnitude of negative charge. Okay, so, if both these conditions are met magnitude of positive charge is equal to magnitude of negative charge and center of positive charge is equal to center of negative charge then the material is charge neutral I mean and it is not polarized also. So, uh, if you look at the system that we have here we have barium which is uh, positively charged you have titanium which is positively charged and you have oxygen which is negatively charged. You have one barium per unit cell you have one titanium per unit cell. So, if you combine these two you have 2 plus plus 4 plus you have 6 plus. So, positive charge per unit cell is 6 plus. Uh, we have 3 oxygens per uh, unit cell, each of them are 2 minus. So, if you take this into account, this is 6 minus. Therefore, this is the total magnitude of positive charge and the total magnitude of negative charge is the same. Therefore, on average, this material is charge neutral. Okay, so, that is the first point we need to note. So, therefore, it meets that criteria, it meets this uh, criteria of uh, uh, charge neutrality. So, this criteria is met. However, it turns out that this material uh, has a ferroelectric behavior 
it means even in the absence of an applied field you see a net uh, you know a polarization of charges that is because you have this condition not being met the center of positive charge is not coinciding with the center of negative charge in this material so the center of the positive charge if if it were a perfect uh, you know uh, if the uh, lattice points were uh, typical of an fcc lattice point then the center corresponding to the phase centers would would be in the, right in the middle of this uh, lattice center co corresponding to the uh, uh, you know uh, corners these eight corners that you have that would also be at the same location so uh, if you and the center corresponding to this uh, uh, central atom would also be at the same location so therefore uh, you would have all of the six negative charges on average sitting at the center of the lattice and all of the six positive char uh, positive charges also sitting at the center of the lattice then uh, you would find that uh, there is no net polarization in this material it turns out that that is not true in barium titanate it turns out that the uh, center of the negative charge is uh, not at the same location as the center of the positive charge to understand this better we will look at this image here so what happens here is that if you uh, uh, look at the uh, uh, structure uh, uh, carefully you find that uh, the uh, uh, positive charges so if you take barium so it is sitting at the corners okay and then if uh, but if you look at the titanium and versus the oxygen you find that the titanium is slightly displaced with respect to the oxygen okay so titanium is in, is in the body center please remember it is at the body center it is right in the middle here so titanium is sitting here and uh, oxygens are in the face center so you are looking at it from the front so you are sort of looking at it from this direction uh, in this next image so if you are looking at it from the front you find that the oxygen uh, uh, ions are all have all moved down a little bit uh, relative to the center of that uh, lattice uh, whereas the uh, uh, titanium ion has moved up a little bit with respect to the center of the uh, of the uh, lattice therefore the net there is a net positive charge the center of all the positive charges put together is a little bit displayed uh, displaced and the center of all the negative charges is a little bit displaced so you see some difference here which is i mean uh, schematically i'm showing you this difference here so the uh, uh, positive and negative charges are slightly displaced um, okay so you sort of think you can think of it that way so it is uh, kind of displaced so therefore this polarization exists so this is a ferroelectric material and uh, this is the way in which uh, it uh, happens to be so now where can we use these materials and uh, what is so important about a ferroelectric nanomaterial so that is something that uh, we need to look at so there are at least a couple of applications if you look at literature you may find uh, more uh, uh, you know possibilities but at least couple of applications which are very technologically significant uh, which we uh, uh, it, in uh, in today's uh, you know usage of uh, technology we interact with in a very significant manner the first is data storage and the second one is lcd displays so both of these uh, are uh, you know technologies that we interact with a lot so in data storage as you, uh, as you know that you know you are storing data in uh, typically these days it is magnetic storage so that is a place where you can store data and uh, maybe ferroelectric materials can be used with respect to that and similarly lcd displays are displays that we use uh, i mean are one of the types of displays that we use uh, for various uh, you know uh, say computer applications or you know even entertainment applications and so on uh, of course there are different types of displays this is one kind of a display so in both cases let's see briefly uh, what is the possibility of using a nano material and uh, and then let us see what is the challenge involved in it so if you uh, look at a ferroelectric material as i said you have a spontaneous dipole moment that can point up or down okay so you have a spontaneous dipole moment that can point upwards or it can point downwards so therefore this can be used to store information see ultimately in uh, in uh, uh, computer storage you are storing everything as a zero or a one right so you have a zero position or a one position so you claim that you know one is uh, switched on or switched off something like that we will have so uh, that's the way in which you uh, put this information together you can convert all thing that you type as as numbers and whatever it is that you are trying to do you convert that to internally it converts everything to zeros and ones so the storage basically has zeros and ones so and then you have some logic by which you read that storage and then do something with it so 
uh, you have to have a system by which you can uh, identify a location and claim that it is 0 and then something should be different about the adjacent location or some other location and you can claim that because it is different I am reading that as a 1 and this you do throughout the uh, device. So, wherever you see the first kind of condition you call it a 0, you wherever you find the second kind of condition you call it 1. So, uh, this has generally been done with ferromagnetic material. So, you can magnetize it upwards or magnetize it downwards uh, and then uh, you can claim that down is 0 and up is 1 and then you can uh, you know on that basis you can uh, you can think of some concept like that based on which you can uh, do this. So, uh, the same concept we can think of for uh, using ferroelectric materials because it has that spontaneous uh, uh, dipole moment spontaneous polarization that can exist in it you can polarize it upwards or you can polarize it downwards. So, uh, the uh, uh, so therefore, you can think of the concept of a ferroelectric bit a bit is basically where you are holding the 0 or 1. So, you can think of uh, it as a ferroelectric bit which you can uh, switch to a condition that you can keep calling as 0 and another condition that you can keep calling as 1. And so, this can typically be written with lower power unlike magnetic bits. So, the common storage that we are using which is magnetic uh, and which is working just fine we are using a lot of it I mean extensively, uh, but if you see uh, the whole field of computer science and engineering. Uh, from the material perspective, uh, they want to reduce the amount of power uh, or amount of electricity required to do each activity. This is very, very important in, uh, in pushing the frontiers of computer science and engineering, uh, particularly the computer engineering uh, to push the frontiers of computer engineering because uh, for more and more uh, calculations to be done, more and more you know uh, uh, operations to be done lot of communication is going on internally. So, current goes somewhere, does something, comes back, does something else, lot of stuff is going on. So, uh, everywhere there is an IR drop and therefore, heat is generated. So, if you take supercomputers, uh, the one of the greatest challenges uh, in the commercialization of supercomputers is the fact that there is a tremendous amount of heat being generated. So, uh, surprisingly in most uh, uh, you know high end computing uh, manufacturing uh, you know let us say companies. Uh, for them air conditioning is a uh, is a very important challenge. You have to air condition the place uh, with the correct flow of air, it is not simply having air conditioner at one corner of the room. You should have a flow of air cool air which is or some other coolant which goes to all those locations where heat is being generated. So, heat management is a very important thing in computer engineering uh, when you get to like really top end computers uh, that are you know pushing the uh, frontiers of what is being accomplished. So, uh, it helps in a tremendous way if you can accomplish the same thing inside the computer using a lot less electricity. That means, uh, the your burden on the cooling decreases dramatically and therefore, you can increase the uh, uh, or with the same amount of cooling you can now increase the amount of computation you can do which is huge. I mean if even if you like half the heat burden you can double the computing power. So, that is dram uh, dramatic right. So, so that is very important. So, people focus on finding ways to reduce the amount of current required. So, it turns out when once they discovered that you can do a change in ferroelectric states from uh, 0 to 1 whatever you call define as 0 to whatever you define as 1. If you can do that change with less electricity than you can do for a magnetic storage going from 0 to 1 then clearly that is a great winner. I mean you have a great thing that you can use in the uh, realm of uh, computer engineering. So, therefore, from the perspective of uh, data storage uh, a ferroelectric bit is more desirable than a ferromagnetic bit as of today right. So, then so therefore, there is interest that is uh, definitely there. So, what is the challenge there? The challenge is this uh, it turns out that the stability of that ferroelectric uh, group uh, for it to stay consistently as 1 or for it to stay consistently as 0 uh, it turns out that this stability happens to uh, occur only if you have slightly larger groups larger groups of atoms. So, that is when it happens and uh, uh, the reason is you know in all these cases there is a thermal energy which is fighting this uh, you know any other internal phenomena that is there. It you can you even you know ferromagnetic behavior etcetera can be uh, disrupted if you have put enough thermal energy into it. So, there is always some thermal energy that is uh, there, uh, there is interaction between uh, adjacent uh, you know polarized uh, locations etcetera. So, uh, you can even though you are trying to set zeros and ones you have conflicting forces which are trying to you know randomize the whole process. So, you need stability in that what you set as 0 should stay stable at 0, what you set as 1 should stay stable as 1. So, this is very important. It turns out that in ferroelectric systems you need to have a little larger collection of atoms for the stability to be maintained for as a 0, another larger collection of atoms and therefore, unit cells for the stability to be maintained as 1. So, 
um, even though it is using less power, if you need a larger collection of uh, atoms to enable uh, you to set 0 or 1, then the your density of uh, information stored decreases. If the density of information stored decreases, now for the same 1 GB hard disk, you will need let us say if let us say you can only store, you need twice as, ma as many atoms to enable you to do this uh, storage with using ferroelectric systems. Then instead of when a 1 GB hard disk has certain size, uh, the same 1 GB hard disk if you were made, you were to make with uh, um, ferroelectric material will have twice the size. So, a factor of 2 is very significant, it is not a small uh, change, I am just giving a factor of 2 as an example, but the point is in uh, computing that is the other challenge, one is to reduce the amount of electricity that is uh, involved, the other is to reduce the size that is there, because the size also impacts the distance that the electricity has to travel to uh, do some activity and again you have the IR drop. So, if you have reduced the amount of electricity required, but you have doubled the distance, you have not really saved anything, right. So, therefore, uh, you, uh, this is a challenge, F uh, if you want to use ferroelectric uh, phenomena for uh, doing data storage, then this is a challenge. Okay, now, so that is with respect to ferroelectric, uh, with respect to data storage. So, now let us see also with respect to LCD displays, LCD displays where does uh, uh, the concept of a ferroelectric uh, material uh, enter into the picture and uh, you know what, what, what are the some possibilities that we have. Generally in LCD displays, you have uh, let us see here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 layers you have, okay. So, usually what will happen is this is the typical kind of layout, uh, this six, 6 layers are in a very thin uh, region. So, some uh, few maybe let us say under 10 micron kind of region you have in which you have these 6 layers and that together is your LCD, dis uh, uh, LCD display. So, the central part of the display is this uh, layer which has the uh, liquid crystal. Now, the liquid crystal consists of uh, molecules which can orient themselves in different ways and then uh, uh, based on uh, electric field. The, so, they are, they have some oriented uh, you know uh, layout but they flow like liquids, I mean so, so they have behavior that is similar to liquids, they also have this organized behavior similar to crystals and that is why you get this name liquid crystal uh, uh, for, the, for this kind of a material. And uh, they are also, uh, you can find a liquid crystal uh, 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 systems which are uh, also you know uh, responsive to electric field. So, you apply the electric field, uh, it will or the crystal will orient in some direction, all of them may be little randomly oriented, once you apply a field they will all orient in a certain way. And uh, there are uh, uh, liquid crystals which will then, which have a twist in, in them and therefore, the uh, if there is light going through them, it will twist the light, okay. So, it will uh, try to twist the light. So, this is the kind of concept uh, that is involved. So, what happens here? The central part is this liquid crystal and there are two electrodes. Then uh, on the front most layer is a polarizer. In this case, I have got the lines horizontal. So, let me just call it horizontal. And this layer here is also a polarizer, but here I have got the lines vertical. So, I will put vertical. And finally, right at the back we have a reflective surface. So, this is the sort of the set of layers that are involved. Now, what happens is if light comes in, so let us say you have uh, uh, light coming in here, some light that is coming in. So, uh, this polarizer that is in front, the horizontal polarizer uh, makes the light uh, only the uh, you know the uh, light that is polarized in the uh, horizontal direction goes through this uh, first layer, all the other light is prevented from going through the layer. So, some light goes through all of which is plane polarized uh, uh, you know in, a, in the horizontal direction that goes through. So, then that goes through there is a transparent electrode it continues past the electrode, it goes through this liquid crystal uh, layer. So, it goes past the, so it first goes through this layer, then it goes through this transparent electrode, then goes through the liquid crystal layer. In the liquid crystal layer uh, based on the orientation of the uh, uh, molecules the light is twisted, okay. So, so now <coughs> Uh, by the time, uh, so between the second electrode and the fourth electrode, if you apply the correct kind of potential, 
then uh, you will find that uh, light that was that started off horizontal you can orient it to vertical condition as it comes off the uh, fourth electrode uh, as it comes through the liquid crystal layer and enters the fourth electrode. So now uh, after it crosses the fourth electrode it will come to the polarizer which is the uh, fifth layer here it arrives at the fifth layer here which is a polarizer which is polarized in the vertical direction. But you have started with a, a light which was polarized in the horizontal direction you twisted it to a light uh, which is now polarized in the vertical direction. So when it comes to the uh, vertical uh, uh, polarized uh, uh, polarizer it is able to go through because the, uh, that vertical polarizer allows light to pass through which is vertically polarized. So it goes through it hits this uh, sixth layer which is this reflective surface and then comes right back. So it does the exact reverse in the back. So it is coming back vertical so it comes through the polarizer then it gets twisted to horizontal condition due to the potential between the two electrodes on either side of the liquid crystal display then comes to the front which is the uh, polarized in the horizontal direction it is also in the horizontal direction it comes right out. So when you set up this situation when you look at the display you see the display is bright so light goes in and comes back and so you see a bright uh, display okay. So now uh, if you do if you apply the potential in some regions such that this uh, twist in, in that in those regions the molecule will not twist the light from horizontal to vertical okay. So let us say it does some random twist it is not going from horizontal to vertical. So then when that light goes to the second polarizer it is not polarized in the vertical direction. So it does not go through the polarizer it does not go through the second polarizer it does not reach that mirror or the reflective surface it does not bounce back as a result you do not see light in that region okay. So, so wherever the polarization of the uh, the twist of the molecule is not correct uh, you will not see the light coming back where it is correctly twisted you will see the light coming back. So this is how you figure out uh, you can force some regions to say stay dark some regions to stay light and that is how you get the display. So you write uh, something in black and white you get it in black and white uh, and then you can do this. So then again we can add some color to it and then you start seeing once you add 3 pixels to it you start seeing the color but in general this is the process. So here also if you want the system to respond faster it is uh, interesting if you can add uh, ferroelectric nanomaterials to those uh, uh, you know liquid crystals and then that will help them respond faster it will help them respond to, uh, to even minor changes in uh, potential. So both again from the perspective of reducing energy so use of ferroelectrics can uh, potentially I mean uh, reduce response time of uh, LCD it will also uh, uh, reduce the amount of energy power required it will reduce the power required for the display to function. Okay, so both these things it will do so or, or at least there is a possibility that it will do both these things and based on the system you can see whether it make which of, which of them is uh, a greater uh, uh, you know phenomenon but at certainly it will help it reduce the power required to do uh, this process. So there is interest in developing ferroelectric materials which are in the nano scale again you the smaller the scale more effective the display is because again for just like for data storage for uh, display also as you are aware pixel size is very important smaller the pixel size the finer is the uh, you know display and therefore the display looks continuous to us rather than you know big squares which are you know pixelated and then you, you do not like the image that you see you want very fine pixels so that the image looks smooth and nice. So then uh, if it is a nanometer sized uh, ferroelectric material that is certainly very useful. So we have seen both with respect to magnetic storage and with respect to LCD displays both of which are like you know technologies that uh, we work with that we uh, utilize quite extensively uh, the availability of a ferroelectric material in the nano scale is very uh, useful to us. Uh, we also saw that uh, uh, I mean the concept of ferroelectric phenomenon itself we saw and we also uh, made note of the fact that uh, uh, due to va various disruptive forces that may exist usually when you go down to the nano scale you are not able to see the ferroelectric behavior uh, in many systems it, it is not showing you you know sustained polarization in the absence of an uh, applied field. So that is a challenge that needs to be overcome. Okay, so what people have done in fact uh, uh, and I will, I will draw your attention to some references at the end of the class. So uh, there were some reports that which said that in uh, for example in a ha uh, hafnium oxide based system 
they found that uh, at extremely small uh, nanometer sized scale they were able to see ferroelectric behavior. And uh, at the same time when they went to slightly larger uh, particle sizes they actually lost the ferroelectric behavior. So, this was uh, counterintuitive and in fact uh, the opposite of what they had seen in many other systems. They found that in the system uh, and initially uh, there was some feeling that maybe it was some artifact of the way it, uh, the uh, experiments had been run or uh, of the samples etcetera. But uh, so, there was some uh, more uh, thought was necessary to understand why this was uh, happening in uh, nanomaterial uh, nanoparticles uh, of this uh, hafnium oxide uh, based system. Uh, and uh, it is also uh, uh, I mean just getting the particles is one thing because you can do you can do that with uh, you know let us say uh, ball milling and so on. Uh, but to do a control study to understand what is going on another group has actually basically looked at ferroelectric thin films. So, they looked at ferroelectric thin films um, uh, to see if uh, 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 they can uh, get their ferroelectric property or lose their ferroelectric uh, property based on the thickness of the film. So, this way you have some control on the size and to see what is happening and uh, uh, so some substrate is taken on which this film is deposited and then they studied the uh, uh, ferroelectric behavior. So, they found that this happened uh, this was true that actually at very uh, uh, small sizes uh, uh, the, the they were able to see ferroelectric behavior. But once they cross some let us say about 10 nanometers or so in size once they started uh, crossing uh, thicker uh, to thicker uh, films the uh, ferroelectric behavior disappeared. So, uh, they were uh, able to confirm that there is some kind of a nano phenomenon that is happening which is what is uh, enabling. Uh, so, there is something unique to the nano scale. So, there is something happening which you can call as a nano phenomenon and that is helping a certain system show you ferroelectric behavior uh, at uh, nano sizes, but not uh, which is disappearing actually in the larger sizes. And uh, when they studied it they found one of the critical parameters was that the substrate on which they were making the film. So, you have usually this kind of a substrate I mean some uh, solid uh, you know, material which is uh, uh, strong and on top of that you deposit the film right and then that is how you study the film. So, they found that the spacing of atoms uh, in the uh, substrate. So, atom spacing interatomic spacing in this area uh, was less than the interatomic spacing in the film based on the original crystal structure that was uh, there for those two uh, materials. So, this means uh, usually what happens is uh, if you look at uh, atoms that are uh, there in any system. So, you will have atoms let us say these are the atoms corresponding to the substrate and you have many of those atoms right. So, you have large number of those atoms. On top of this you are putting the a uh, layer of the film. Generally what happens is uh, the atoms tend to line up because that is when they have the uh, least amount of energy relative to other locations that they may have. So, the crystalline structure uh, tries to sustain the same crystalline structure on either side uh, that is when the overall system has uh, less energy. So, they try to line up. So, now if your original material actually had larger spacing let me just exaggerate it here. So, that uh, let us say as a separate material it had spacing like that. you are taking a material that is widely spaced and you are trying to force it down. Right? So, by doing so you are actually applying a compressive stress on that material and it is strained in a compressive direction. So, uh, therefore, they found that uh, this strain seems to be having an impact on the ability of that material to show you uh, the uh, uh, you know ferroelectric behavior in the uh, in, in under some uh, conditions. And uh, basically as you add more and more atoms you, you keep adding more and more uh, atoms on top then it goes back to having the original spacing of that material right. So, that is how that is how the material behaves. So, the thinner the layer the greater is the impact of the substrate on the layer the thicker the layer less is the impact of the substrate on the layer ok. So, the, because the layer starts having its own behavior as you move away from that interface it is very critical to be close to that interface. So, they were able to see that the when you apply strain uh, this seems to be happening. So, first of all that this phenomenon is true it is happening and it is happening in the nano scale and that it is happening due to the uh, presence of compressive stresses. So, then they in, uh, investigated the uh, uh, nanomaterial itself in some uh, greater detail and they, uh, they reached the conclusion 
that uh, basically at very small particle sizes uh, due to very large surface energy of all those uh, bonds that are still unsaturated that are trying to reach, reach out to each other to saturate uh, themselves, they are sort of effecti effectively compressing that particle, they are compressing the particle. In that system, it turns out that you can think of it as a high pressure that is being generated on the surface of the particle trying uh, very hard to saturate those bonds that uh, uh, you know uh, sort of competitive uh, thing that is happening there uh, leads to uh, a strain that is being generated in the system. Okay, so, there is some strain that is being generated in the system uh, as a direct result of this uh, process that it is uh, uh, where there is all these bonds that are trying to uh, compete and compress each other. So, therefore, uh, using thin film based experiments, some groups have been able to show uh, demonstrated demonstrate in control conditions phenomena that was that is Uh, seen in nanoparticles synthesized by other means such as ball milling. So, uh, so this is also nice to know see how they, they were trying to investigate uh, nano sized phenomena and they are uh, I mean so different people have tried different things. Uh, so, uh, the synthesis technique is important uh, when you are doing uh, science related to nanomaterials because the synthesis technique uh, brings with it certain peculiarities um, which you should be conscious of and therefore, you can very intelligently take advantage of uh, and that is the or at least be alert to. So, you see if you see some phenomena and you are trying to understand then you start thinking about all these things the strain that is there and then so on and then uh, try to reach a conclusion based on it. So, ball milling gives a different kind of uh, conditions to the particles uh, they are being hammered they are broken down but maybe it could introduce impurities you are already talking of a nano scaled uh, material uh, in that even if you have a few atoms of impurities then uh, that is a significant uh, you know percentage of impurities uh, and you may have variation in sizes you may not have enough control uh, to say that you know you got only this particular size. So, uh, you have those peculiarities with associated with it. The thin film on the other hand uh, you can measure the thickness of the thin film. Uh, usually thin films are made under you know high vacuum conditions and uh, you know very clean conditions. So, you have much greater possibility that you are getting a much purer uh, product and, and therefore, with greater confidence you can say that you know the property I am seeing is the property of that particular oxide layer uh, rather than something else. So, you get that kind of a control, but it is not a particle. So, you are uh, then trying to extrapolate some result from that uh, thin film. Uh, to another synthesis process which is the uh, uh, ball milling kind of process and then trying to understand why there is a phenomenon that is showing up in both cases. Uh, you have understood that there is some you know some uh, you know let us say stress in this case could be something else in another uh, uh, experiment you are doing. You understood that you have to see what is happening in the particle uh, morphology which is uh, you know sort of mimicking this in the thin film morphology. So, like this lot of interesting work is there and uh, this is uh, an example of uh, where this has been done. So, uh, we see that there is a path to get to uh, nanomaterials which have a ferroelectric behavior and in fact not just that we find materials which very uniquely give you this uh, ferroelectric behavior only in the nano scale and that is again very interesting to see. So, here are a couple of references which you can go and look up. Uh, so, this is a pretty recent uh, reference in uh, nature uh, materials uh, you can see this is the volume and so on uh, it is a 2018 uh, publication you can look at it. Uh, it talks of uh, rhombohedral ferroelectric phase in epitaxially strained uh, hafnium zirconium ox uh, oxide uh, thin films uh, and this is the group that has done it. So, you can uh, go and take a look at it uh, 
uh, with, to see much greater details of this specific system, uh, what they did with respect to the specific system, how they made those measurements uh, and uh, uh, you know how they were able to you know come up with a theory that helped them uh, link things up. Uh, there are quite a few dis uh, uh, references on uh, ferroelectric uh, use of ferroelectric uh, nanomaterials in pneumatic liquid crystals. So, this is just one example of it uh, that I am showing you here. Uh, if you go and look at uh, references, you will find several uh, such uh, references, you can uh, certainly look at them uh, looking at that exact idea that we were uh, discussing a little while earlier in the class. So, in summary, uh, generally it has been seen that ferroelectricity uh, or ferroelectric behavior uh, typically seems to break down in uh, nano scale. Um, it, uh, at the same time, studies have shown that in some systems, interestingly, uh, the uh, ferroelectric behavior seems to be uh, visible, in fact, particularly in the uh, nano scale as opposed to the uh, macro scale. And uh, uh, there are ways to, uh, we found that you know there is a lot of application to this uh, uh, ferroelectricity uh, in the nano scale, both with respect to two, I mean, at least with respect to two major uh, technologies that we would be interested in uh, data storage and displays, both of which we, I mean, extensive, extensively use in uh, modern uh, uh, world today. Both these cases you would uh, see that there is a, some uh, need for these uh, nano materials which show ferro ferroelectricity and therefore, to first of all make them is interesting, to understand how they, uh, how they behave and why they behave so is another uh, interesting thing. So, we could see that there are studies which seem to show that surface pressure uh, which, uh, which, which may be significant in the case of uh, nano materials because of their curved surface and so on. Um, that surface pressure because of the high surface area that is there, the large number of unsaturated bonds that are there uh, sort of effectively contributes to a compressive force on that particle and that seems to uh, create a, uh, because of the pressure uh, you are moving from one phase that is stable in as per the phase diagram at room temperature and atmospheric pressure uh, to another phase which is at room temperature, but at a much higher pressure. Even though you are not applying physically, you do not seem to be applying any pressure. You are not putting some pressure, you are not you know compressing it in a uh, cylinder or any such thing. So, we are not applying any such pressure, but still there seems to be pressure being developed uh, by the system itself and that helps it to move from one phase to another phase because the phase diagram say and as, as dictated by the phase diagram of that system. And this combination of events helps us have a ferroelectric material in the nano scale. So, that is our summary for the class, uh, very interesting use of ferroelectric materials in the nanoscale and the phenomenon and the science behind it. Thank you.